Okay, so welcome back at the second half. And there is something which I should have said at the very beginning, but somehow I thought it's known already, that these slides are going to be available. I guess, Felix, are they going to be uploaded on the conference website, or is there no? Yeah, so, so you don't have to take notes. Uh, you will have all these posters available for you. Okay, uh, I think they are far too fast for for taking notes. Um, okay, so what we have done in the, in the previous half is that we wanted to, to get a general overview of various information measures and how we can define information measures from more general quantities, which are divergences. Okay. And we did it in a, on a very abstract high level. We considered these divergences, looked at its, their properties, and we have seen how these properties translate into properties of these information measures that we consider intuitively um, relevant or important or, or natural. Okay. So this was the, the two main building block. And in the last one, we have seen a, a concrete application or a concrete problem, information theoretic problem, where some of these quantities appeared, namely the, the divergence radius and the, the conditional entropy corresponding to these infinity star rainy divergences. Okay. So this is where we are now. And the second half of the talk is going to be about rainy divergences. Okay. So it's all going to be focused on rainy divergences and information measures uh, derived from rainy divergences and also their information theoretic applications. Again, this second half is going to have two halves. The first one is going to be quite detailed, where I try to convince you that these rainy divergences are indeed very natural, and somehow try to give an intuition why they are so natural. And in the second half, I'm going to go through or go over a few uh, applications of, um, of information measures derived from these rainy divergences, some of them very recent. Regarding the difficulty of following the second part, the first part of the second part is going to be very detailed, as I said, uh, but it's also going to be quite technical and involves a lot of mathematics. So at any point, if something is not clear, please interrupt with a question and I will be very happy to try to explain. The second half will be different because I'm not going to give details, I just list various applications and uh, hope that you might find some of them interesting. Okay, so this is the plan. Um, I appreciate that you are still here. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so please ask if you, have, if you have any doubts. So let's start with, with the first part. So again, buckle up, it's, it's going to be a little bit technical, but ask if you cannot follow something. So we are considering the same problem as in the previous part. Um, namely binary state discrimination. So I just repeat again, so the problem is that Alice wants to send Bob one of two possible messages using a quantum system, and she encodes her message, in, which is now either zero or one, into some state of a quantum system, sends it over to Bob over a quantum channel, and this time I denote the two possible states arriving at Bob by row, if Alice has sent zero, and with sigma if Alice has sent one. Okay, so they are going to be our main objects, this rho and sigma. And on the receiving end, Bob is going to perform a binary POVM with outcome zero and one. And obviously we can identify such a binary POVM with a single operator corresponding to T zero, because the other one is just one minus T, okay. Good, and in this case, there are two different ways Bob can make a, an error in identifying the, measure, the message. Namely, he can decide that Alice has sent one, but actually Alice has sent zero. And you can easily compute the probability of this event by this formula. Okay. So this corresponds to Alice message zero, and this corresponds to Bob measurement operator corresponding to one. And there is the type two error, uh, in which case Alice sends one, but Bob decides that the message was zero. And again, we can compute very easily the probability of this even. Okay. There is no particular reason why they are called type one and type two. It's just to distinguish them from each other. Okay. 
And we have already seen in the previous talk that the optimal symmetric error probability, when we are just weighting these two error probabilities with equal weights, and we want to minimize it, it can be expressed explicitly in, with help of the trace norm distance. Okay. So this gives the relevance of the trace norm distance. And we can also see from this expression, I think this is not very good, no? I, I was asked to put it on the left-hand side, but it's constantly making some noise. OK, let's see if it's going to be. No, it's not good. Maybe this one's going to be better. OK, so we can see that this is strictly positive unless the support of rho is orthogonal to the support of sigma. Okay. So it, makes that, it means that we cannot make both of these error probabilities to be 0 simultaneously. Okay. So there is some sort of trade-off in between them. And to reduce this error, Alice can follow a very simple strategy, simply send the same message many times, hoping that in this case somehow her message is going to get through. And in this case, we just have to modify these expressions for the type 1 and type 2 error, because in this case, message 0 is encoded into this state, and message 1 is encoded into this state. And just as before, this optimal error probability can be expressed by this trace term formula. Okay. So this is hopefully all clear. And here's an exercise for you. Um, there is this fuchs van der graaff inequalities that relate the trace norm distance to the fidelity. I think they are quite well known. If not, then ninth chapter of Niels and Chuang. And with that, you can very easily show that actually this er error probability is going to decay exponentially fast uh, as n goes to infinity. So that's very good. Exponential decay of error probabilities is good. But we want to know more. We want to know what the optimal exponent is. OK, so basically, this is about how many times should Alice use this, uh, this communication uh, system in order to get her message through with a predefined probability. And for this, it is important to know the, the exact exponent. And more generally, here we have treated the, the two error probabilities on equal footing, but some, one of them might be more important than the other. We might to make sure that one of them decays with a, with a certain speed. So the more general question is, what are the achievable rate pairs? So we, we expect both of the error probabilities to decay exponentially quickly. And we look at the individual exponential rates. And we try to, to plot this region in the plane. And we, we want to see what are the achievable rates, uh, which can be done by, um, by finding the boundary of this region. And we can find the boundary of this region by fixing one of the rates, and then look at all the possible rates under this condition. Okay, so it's like taking a, a two-dimensional region and, and slicing it with, with vertical or horizontal lines. Okay, so this is what we, what we want to achieve. Is it all clear so far? Question, yeah? Uh, well, there is a trade-off in between them. So this formula that I have shown here, um, this, ex uh, yeah, this expresses a, a lower bound on the sum, basically. So this means that you can reduce one of them, but then the other will probably increase, and vice versa. I don't know if this is what you meant by, yeah. OK, other question? OK. So then I assume that everyone understands what the, what the problem is. And let's, let's go to the solution. So this is, this is going to be probably the, the really technical part. So the strategy that we are going to follow is we try to introduce some constant, which is a kind of tuning parameter, to adjust the balance between these two rates. Okay. So we expect these probabilities to be, behave exponentially. So we put an exponential prefactor before one of them. Okay. And we want to minimize this kind of expression instead of the previous uh, weighted error expression. By definition, this is of this form. So I, I just rewrote it again. And in general, 
So you can see that this can be translated in, into this problem. You have a positive semi-definite operator, which is this one here, and an other positive semi-definite operator, which is sigma tensor n multiplied by this exponential prefactor. And we want to find the minimum of this expression over all possible operators between zero and identity. Okay. And we have talked about trace minimum and trace maximum of operators in the previous talk. And it turns out that this minimal value is exactly the trace of the trace minimum of the two operators. Okay. So again, we see emerging these concepts um, in a concrete practical setting. And moreover, um, yeah, we, we can also give an explicit formula for this trace minimum, which is just uh, more or less dual to, to the expression for the trace maximum. One has to be careful here, it's part of the exercise. Find an example where you have two positive semi-definite operators, but their trace minimum is not positive semi-definite. Okay, so this kind of ordering or taking minimum and maximum is a, has some well, kind of unwanted properties or at least different from what we are used to. Okay, and moreover, what is important for us is that we can explicitly determine the optimal operator here. And this is also part of the exercise that the optimum is attained if and only if this T operator is lower bounded and upper bounded by two projections. And these projections are defined the following way. If you have a self-adjoint operator, and this is self-adjoint because this is the difference of two positive semi-definite operators, then you can take the spectral decomposition, and for every possible constant C, this is just going to be a spectral projection of X corresponding to all the eigenvalues that are at least as large as C. Okay, so this is just a notation. This is the same notation as the level sets for functions. So here we think of self-adjoint operator as real valued functions. Okay, so we have this optimization problem for the error probabilities and it turns out that we can explicitly determine the value and we can explicitly determine the optimal T. And from this exercise, you can see that the optimal T, the optimal measurement operator, will be a so-called Neyman-Pearson test, which is just this spectral projection of the self-adjoint operator. Okay. This is a very famous thing in, in classical statistics. That's where the name is coming from. And so we can write this TN operator up into here, and we get that this minimum is actually the type 1 error probability evaluated on this measurement operator and the type 2 error probability evaluated in this measurement operator. Okay, so we have solved our first problem. That's very good. And this equality here uh, can be rephrased as the so-called Neyman-Pearson lemma. So this minimum minimization um, can be rephrased as if you are looking at all tests, with a given type two error rate. So we fix somehow the exponential behavior of this, then among such tests with a, with a fixed type two error rate, the Neyman-Pearson test will have the lowest type one error rate. So when you want to optimize these two error rates, then it is enough to consider Neyman-Pearson tests always. You don't have to consider general measurements. Okay. This is the content of the Neyman-Pearson lemma. And actually, there is a whole branch of information theory that has grown out from this observation. It's the information spectrum method, which is studying the, the asymptotic behavior of error probabilities on these Neyman-Pearson tests. Okay, but I'm not going to go into this direction. Okay, so to, to get a, a kind of understanding of what these Neyman-Pearson tests are and how these error probabilities behave, consider the classical situation. Um, in classical situations, we have, we have probability density functions, and these tests correspond to looking at uh, outcome sequences of these random events, which satisfy this inequality. So this is a so-called maximum likelihood test or a modified maximum likelihood test or a log likelihood ratio test. So if I put zero here, then this would mean that I accept the candidate rho if and only if the probability of the outcome with respect to rho is larger than with respect to sigma. So this is the usual maximum likelihood decision scheme. And here I introduce some bias parameter to favor either rho or, or sigma. 
And now, if you know a little bit of classical probability theory, well, one of the first things that you learn is Markov inequality. And if you want to compute the probability of the error probabilities uh, corresponding to this kind of test, then you can just use Markov inequality to get exponential bounds on these type 1 and type 2 error probabilities, which is going to look like this. What is important for us here is that it is exponentially decaying in n. You have an optimization depending on this parameter alpha. And what is appearing here are the so-called classical Rényi divergences, okay. which are defined by this formula for any two probability distribution, rho and sigma, and some positive parameter alpha. Now we are, yeah, OK. And if you know a little bit more advanced probability theory, then you might have heard about large deviation theorems that are uh, basically a strengthening of the law of large numbers. And from that, it is possible to derive that these ones are actually sharp in the asymptotics. Okay. So this is just elementary classical probability theory computations. And what we get, we get the exact asymptotics uh, exponential rates for these Neyman Pearson tests, which are going to be given by these optimization formulas involving the classical Rényi divergences. And many people have asked after talks that why do Rényi divergences appear, or why are they important, or, or how to understand um, why they show up in this kind of um, error exponent computation problems. And the reason is that in classical probability theory, this is a very natural kind of decision scheme to consider. And the corresponding error probabilities can be computed using large deviation theory. And in large deviation theory, you get the so-called logarithmic moment generating functions. And they are going to decide how fast these error probabilities are decaying. And the logarithmic moment generating function corresponding to this log likelihood ratio test is exactly the Rényi divergence. Okay. So this is one, maybe not the most intuitive, but but a very correct answer to why you are getting Rényi divergences in all these problems. Okay. Was this more or less clear? Question, yeah? Once again? So you mentioned that you want to fix type 2 error. Yeah. Is it not for this slide? Yeah, so what, what we can do here is that for each fixed C, we can, um, we can compute explicitly the error rates. And then if I want to fix it, I just fix this value and then see what, I, what am I going to get for that particular value. So fixing the rate means fixing C. So if I want to see, fix the type 2 error rate, then I, I have to find a C such that this expression here is equal to my rate. And then from that, I can compute this rate here. OK. Yes? Why are these things called divergences? Uh, <laughs> good question. Um, I don't really have an answer to this. I know that some people find it confusing, so apparently some other branches of physics divergence means something totally different. Um, no idea. I mean, divergence means how, well, in some sense, how different they are, and they quantify how different they are, and also they somehow quantify how they diverge, because if you're taking powers, then they are growing linearly, so they are growing away from each other somehow. This is what I can come up with. Any other question? OK. So this was, this was all classical. And uh, I would say this is very, it's only using very standard techniques from classical probability theory. Now, the thing is that in quantum theory, we don't have large deviation theory. And it's not really obvious how to divide operators with each other. So we have to find some other ways to compute these error exponents. And the way will be to, to find some replacements for these large deviation bounds. And for that, we have to use operator monotone functions. Who knows what an operator monotone function is? OK. Um, so in general, 
if we have a function, we will restrict our attention to functions defined on the positive half line, real functions. Then, of course, we know what it means to be monotone. And we can put operators in functions. Just using the spectral calculus, well, you can diagonalize the operator and compute the function of the diagonal elements, more or less. And then you can ask, and, and we have an order on operators. So as we have, as I have defined before, we have this positive semi-definite order. So we can say that one operator is larger than, than the other. And we can ask that whether a function that is monotone on numbers is still going to be monotone on operators. Yeah. And it turns out that not necessarily. So it's very easy to find examples, and that's one of your exercises, to prove that the power functions are not operator monotone when alpha is larger than 1, even though they are obviously monotone for numbers. And you can find the counterexamples by just using 2 by 2 matrices, yes? Um, why does this definition concern all operators the space? Yeah, so very good question. So. Here, the Hilbert space is fixed. You can consider any two operators that are positive, semi-definite, and are ordered like this. And then, this should hold for any Hilbert space of finite dimension, or any separable Hilbert space, doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, so that, there is a dimension hidden there. Um, but it, it should hold for all possible dimensions. Okay. And so these functions are not monotone for alpha larger than 1, but it turns out that they are monotone for alpha between 0 and 1. So this, this concept is very non-trivial because it doesn't carry through uh, completely to, to operators. There are functions which are monotone on numbers, but not monotone on operators. But there are other functions which are also monotone on operators. This is a very nice area of matrix analysis. And uh, the key technique to get our Rainy divergences in the quantum case is going to be an inequality which is called Udenard's inequality. And it says the following, that if you take any two positive semi-definite operators, then computing this quantity here, in which you can just recognize the optimal um, error probability that we have derived before, is upper bounded by this expression for every alpha between 0 and 1. So this, half, this part of the statement will go going to give our quantum Rainy divergences. So this is a statement that we relate the error probability to the quantum Rainy divergences. And that's how we are going to get into quantum Rainy divergences. And I was thinking of showing you the proof, and maybe I will do that, uh, since I have written it out here. So this is a different proof from the original. This is due to a Japanese operator algebra is called Ozawa. And I want to show it to you because it uses concepts from the previous parts of the talk. So you, you take these two positive semi-definite operators, and it is obvious that these two operators are larger than either of them, and they are equal to each other. This is clear. What is interesting to note is that this is, again, nothing else but, apart from normalization, this R infinity center, or D infinity uh, center, so the, the center of the two operators with respect to the infinite Rainy divergence. Or in other terms, this is the trace maximum of these two operators. Okay. So this concept of the trace maximum appears also here. And then the proof is just constantly using these, these inequalities and the operator monotonicity of the power function. Okay. So we start with this expression here. We will see that this is, the, this is a good idea to start. In the first step, we, we do nothing, just split this A into this product. The second part, uh, oops, I replace this A but by this bigger operator here. Okay. And because this power function is operator monotone, I get a, a larger quantity. Next step, I just rewrite this. Um, in this form, this is just rearranging. And then again, I can replace this A here by this larger operator on the power alpha, because the alpha power is operator monotone. OK, I rewrite again. And in this step, I just expand. Again, nothing happens. And here again, I use that this operator is larger than B. And the power function is operator monotone, so this is a positive semi-definite operator. This whole thing is positive. Uh, no, sorry, it's the other way around. This is negative semi-definite because this is larger. And therefore, this is upper bounded by this quantity. 
So what I get is that trace a minus this expression is upper bounded by trace a to the power alpha b to the power one minus alpha. And this here is nothing else but this operator. We have already, I mean, this is a, a trivial calculation. Okay, by the way, do you know what the positive part of an operator is? Maybe I should have defined it. Who knows what the positive part is? Okay, so this basically means that we just keep the positive eigen eigenvalues and throw away the rest. Okay. So it's, it's like the positive part of a function. So this proof is indeed very simple, and it's nice that we see these concepts of that we have, we have seen before showing up in this proof. Okay. And now what we can do is we can apply this inequality to this particular choice of operator. And if you do that, well, here are just a, a few trivial things. So remember, we are concerned with this quantity. We can explicitly express it in this form. That's very easy to see. And actually, we have, we have already seen this. And obviously, a sum of non-negative numbers is at least as large as the maximum of these two non-negative numbers. So, so far, nothing happened. And here we are using this inequality, um, which translates exactly like this. And because it holds for every alpha, then we can take an infimum here. Okay, so this is the crucial step. This is how we are going to get from error probabilities to rainy divergences. Okay, by the use of this inequality. And now, we can use that here we are taking tensor powers. The trace is multiplicative under tensor powers. Um, so, and we can exponentialize everything. And what we will get is just an exponential expression minus n times something, where this something is defined by this formula. So I, I just put this thing here to the exponent. And using that, this bound is an upper bound for this and also for this. Then we see that the type 1 error probability for the Neyman Pearson test is upper bounded by this exact formula, where this phi c is just expre this expression, which is nothing else but the Legend transform of this function. And to get a bound on the type 2 error probability, we have to divide by e to the power n times c, and therefore we get this expression here. Okay. So this, this very simple inequality immediately gives us exponential bounds on these two error probabilities. And therefore, we have almost established or almost reached our goal. Namely, what we are interested in is this so-called direct exponent. So what I have explained before by words, we take the type 2 error probability and we impose an exponential decay constraint on this type 2 error probability. And we want to see that under this constraint, what is the best exponent for the type 1 error probability that we can achieve? And obviously, we want this type 1 error probability to decay as fast as possible. So we are taking the supremum over all possible sequences of measurements, all possible sequences of decoding strategies for Bob. Okay. So this is our quantity of interest. And from this simple expression, we can see that if we choose this phi c plus c to be larger than r, then this condition is obviously satisfied. And then all these phi values are going to be, going to give bounds, lower bounds on this exponent. So this inequality is immediate from this one. And this takes a little bit of work, but completely elementary, to see that this supremum actually can be rewritten in this form, where we have an optimization over a parameter alpha between 0 and 1. And what we get here are the so-called PETS type Rainy divergences which for any two positive semi-definite operators, non-zero, are defined by this formula. Okay. So here there is a split between, the, between two cases. If alpha is between zero and one, or the support of rho is dominated by the support of sigma, then we have this formula. Otherwise, we have plus infinity. Okay. And this is how the, a certain type of quantum Rainy divergence appears in this state discrimination problem. Now, what we want is actually the exact value of this, uh, of this direct error exponent. Here we got a lower bound, but it turns out that this is actually an inequality. So it's, it's not only a, a lower bound, it's also an upper bound. 
And I'm not going to go into the details of this proof, but I will sketch the, the main idea because it is, it is very important. So the main idea is to reduce this quantum problem into a classical state discrimination problem. By the following way, we take these two states and we look at the um, spectral decompositions. And from these two quantum states, we can define two classical probability distributions by these formulas. You can easily check that if these are density operators, then these are going to be pro probability distributions. And a very a trivial but key observation is that the classical Rényi divergence of these two classical probability distributions is the same as the quantum Rényi divergence of these two quantum states. Okay. So this is very important. And this is one way of getting the quantum Rényi divergence from the, from the classical one. And what turns out, and what I'm, I'm going to skip here, the proof, is that the optimal exponent for the state discrimination problem of these two classical probability distributions is an upper bound for the quantum problem. Okay. This is, again, not very complicated to see, but I, I don't want to spend the time here on that. And it is well known in, in the classical case, you can, you can prove it using large deviation theory, that indeed this is explicitly equal to this. And now we use this correspondence to see that we get back the quantum Rényi divergences. Okay. So this establishes equality before we had the, the opposite inequality. So what we get is the so-called quantum Höfding-Baum theorem, um, which says that for every possible rate R, For every possible rate R, um, I'm sorry, we can express this optimal type 1 error ex exponent <coughs> given that the type 2 error exponent is R by this formula. And this gives a, an operational interpretation of this particular version of this quantum Rényi divergences. Okay? At least for the parameter values of alpha between 0 and 1. Okay. You're just too close to that speaker. Ah, okay, I see. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. I, I try to move away from the speaker. Thanks. Okay. Now, you might complain that this is actually not a, an operational interpretation for D alpha, but for this strange optimization involving all the D alphas. This can be remedied by two different ways. One is to slightly modify the original problem and arrive at these so-called generalized cutoff rates introduced by Chisar. I'm not going to explain that, but the important thing is that then you get an explicit operation interpretation for a, a particular parameter alpha. And another way to get around this is delegated to an exercise that you can easily prove that this function is actually convex in the parameter alpha. Um, now, if, it, if this is, okay, this is one part of the exercise, and here this sentence is not completely correct because this it, it refers to this expression. So the task is to rewrite this as a Legendre transform of some function related to this function, and then we know that the Legendre transform of the Legendre transform of a convex function, if it's continuous, gives back the original function. This is the bipolar theorem for for polar transformations, which means that using this technique, you can express these Rényi divergences as an optimization over these error rates R of this form, where here these are all operational quantities. They are the optimal type 1 error rates. So you can express explicitly the Rényi divergences in terms of operational quantities. Why is it good? Well, apart from getting an operational interpretation for this, it is almost trivial to show that from this expression, we can prove that these Rényi divergences are monotone under completely positive trace-preserving maps. Okay. So this is a, a very indirect way to prove monotonicity, which is basically a matrix analytic question but it's a very operational way of proving monotonicity. And actually, every quantity, every divergence that has an operational interpretation 
should be monotone because of the operational interpretation. Okay. So this is, this is a very nice thing. It's due to Nagaoka, Hiroshi Nagaoka. Okay. And this indeed gives a fully operational proof of the monotonicity of the alpha. So we have achieved two things. We have established that these quantities are operationally relevant and we have proved their, their monotonicity, which is important to us. Okay. And a few more, bit more discussion um, about this, uh, this result. Another exercise is to use the convexity of this function to see that these Rényi divergences are monotone increasing in the parameter alpha. Okay. And moreover, if you take alpha go to one, then you get back the standard relative entropy. What is the implication of this? Um, I have been talking about exponential decay rates, but actually it's only true if this exponent here is strictly positive. Otherwise, we have something which is exponential in, with an exponent zero, which only means that it's upper bounded by a constant, which is not very surprising for probabilities. Okay. So what's interesting is when this expression is strictly positive, and from this exercise you see that this is strictly positive exactly if the rate is smaller than the relative entropy of the two states. Okay. And as a corollary, well, we can deduce from this that for every type two error rate which is smaller than the relative entropy, the optimal type one rate will go to zero. And it will go to zero exponentially fast with, with this exponent. And this is called the direct part of Stein's lemma, which is a, a classic result in, in quantum statistics. And then you, you might ask what happens when, when the rate is larger than the relative entropy? And the related question is, is there an operational interpretation for the d alpha for alpha larger than one? Because here we only consider the alpha between zero and one. Okay. So what we expect from, from wisdom from classical statistics is that if the rate is for the type two error is larger than the relative entropy, then the type one error will not go to zero, it will actually go to one. Okay. And it will go to one exponentially fast, and this is called the strong converse property. And therefore, for these large rates, we are interested in a different quantity, which is called the strong converse exponent, when again, we fix the exponential behavior of the type two error, and we want to optimize the speed with which the success probability is going to zero, or the error probability is going to one. And because we don't want the error probability to go to one, we take the infimum here. Okay. So this is the quantity of interest in this case. And classically, it's very easy to show that we get a very similar formula as for the direct rate involving these Rényi divergences with parameter alpha larger than one. So the question is, can we extend our previous result to the quantum case? Well, here's another exercise that proved that if we have this with the, the previously introduced Rényi divergences, then again, because of this operational interpretation, we would obtain that these quantities are monotone under CPTP maps for every alpha larger than one. If we have an operational interpretation, we have monotonicity. But now, if it is monotone, then these quantities, which are the key quantities for these Rényi divergences, they would also be monotone. And at the beginning of the tutorial, we have seen that monotonicity under certain conditions is equivalent to joint convexity. Okay. So this quantity would be jointly convex. Remember, the conditions were this homogeneity and this direct sum property. Okay, so we are referring back to that here. And then it is easy to see that if this quantity would be jointly convex, then that would imply that the power function is operator convex for every alpha larger than one. But we know it from matrix analysis that it is not true. So for t larger than, oh sorry, this should be alpha larger than two. So for the power larger than two, this function is not operator convex. Okay, so this strategy cannot work. We cannot get the same expression as in the classical case using our previous Rényi divergences. What shall we do then? Well, what turned out to be the solution is that we should find an other 
uh, notion of quantum Rényi divergences, different from the PETS type quantum Rényi divergences. And these are the so called sandwich Rényi divergences that are, I told about before, were introduced in two papers more or less the same time, and Mark is here, author of one of them. Um, and they are defined by this formula, which looks very similar to the previous one, except that the powers of rho and sigma are arranged in a little bit different way. And it turns out that using these Rényi divergences, we can actually express the strong converse exponent with a formula similar to the previous one, and a formula that extends the classical one, but we have to use these, these sandwich Rényi divergences. So this way we get an operational interpretation for these new quantities for every parameter of a larger than one. Okay? And it's a reminder that the direct rate was expressed in this form, so you can compare the two, and what you will see is two differences. One is that here we use the PETS type Rényi divergences, here the sandwich type, here we are optimizing over alpha between zero and one, here we are optimizing over alpha larger than one. Okay? And this indicates that in the quantum case, we should extend the classical Rényi divergences in a split way, namely for alpha between zero and one, we should use these ones because they are the ones with operational interpretation, and for alpha larger than one, we should use these ones because they are the ones with operational interpretations. Okay. So this was the introduction of, of Rényi, quantum Rényi divergences, how they appear, and um, well, how the, the extension from classical is, is not completely trivial. Okay. A few observations related to these results is that in the proof of this we use monotonicity. Um, well, doesn't matter, it's a, it's a technical comment. And um, another thing is that one can see that, so here we got the operation interpretation for every alpha larger than one, and if you take alpha going to plus infinity, then we get the, this d infinity star uh, Rényi divergences, which I have introduced at the very beginning of the talk. So now we are connecting back to the, to the first, uh, well, the beginning of the talk. So this was this expression that we called max relative entropy. So they are related also to this, this state discrimination problem. Okay. And also, if you take parameter one half for this family, then you get back this formula that I have introduced at the very beginning. Okay. But this one has no operational interpretation, or at least not that I know. Which is a curious thing because the fidelity is probably the most used divergence measure in quantum information theory, but I, I don't know any, any operational interpretation of it. Okay. A few more comments about these Rényi divergences. Um, the sandwich is almost always at most as big as the, the, the PETS type, and this is equivalent to the so-called Arachili-Turing inequality, which is an important inequality in matrix analysis. But it has a converse inequality, which is a very recent result and very nice result. You can actually just use Hölder inequality to establish this. So for alpha close to one, they are close to each other. Basically, does the statement. And because we know that for when alpha goes to one, this goes to the relative entropy, we immediately get that this sandwich one also goes to the relative entropy when alpha goes to one. Okay. But you can also verify this by a direct computation. If you are good with differentiating matrix functions, then you can compute this by differentiation. Okay. Um, these quantities are also monotone in alpha. This is a little bit less easy to see. And again, we are interested in this quantity when it is larger than zero because that that gives us an exponential decay, and this will happen if and only if the rate is larger than the relative entropy due to these properties established in these exercises. So the corollary we get is that for every type two error rate which is larger than the relative entropy, the optimal type one error goes to one, okay? Exponentially fast, and this is called the strong converse part of Stein's lemma. Okay. So summarizing Stein's lemma, if you want the, op the type one error to go to zero, then the best decay of the type two error that we can achieve is an exponential decay, and the exponent is exactly 
the relative entropy, this omega key relative entropy, and this gives an operational interpretation of the relative entropy. So now we have an operational interpretation of all the divergences that I have introduced in the beginning that have a known operational interpretation. Okay, so this was a part about why we are getting Rényi divergences and what quantum Rényi divergences are. And the last part of the talk is going to be an overview um, of the information measures that we can derive from these Rényi divergences and where they appear in quantum information theory. Um, I think I still have 40 minutes, is that correct? Okay. So now if you have a, a question, then, then please ask. Now we are changing topic a little bit again. Those who are still awake. Okay. Well, if not, then I'm taking the optimistic uh, attitude and expect that all this is understood. And, and we continue with this. I probably won't use all the, all the time left. Okay, so here's just a reminder. So we have these two Rényi divergences. We are, for the rest of the talk, we are going to be concerned about these two quantities. They are defined in very with very similar formulas, but you see that inside this trace, there is something different. The powers here still add to alpha for rho and one minus alpha for sigma, but they are distributed in a different way. And because of non-commutativity of these operators, these two things are not the same. But when rho and sigma commute, they actually reduce to the same quantities. Okay. And remember, we started our investigations by establishing properties for abstract divergences. So you can verify that both of them satisfy a host of these, these properties, basically all of them that, that we wanted, except for monotonicity, because that's not, not true for all of them. Um, but only for certain parameter ranges. And uh, the key properties are encoded in these trace quantities inside. I put this signum alpha minus one here to, to compensate for the, the sign of this alpha minus one here. And it is easy to see that these quantities are homogeneous and they also have the direct sum property for every alpha larger than one. This was something that we, we were interested in in the beginning. So we can see that either of them is jointly convex if and only if it is monotone. Okay, so this is what we established using this Ullmann and Petz method. And this in turn is equivalent to the monotonicity of the corresponding Rényi divergence because there is only a logarithm factor and that's a monotone function. Okay, so that's very easy. And this is a theorem which is, well, far from being obvious that the first type of Rényi divergences are monotone if and only if the parameter is between zero and two, and the sandwich ones are monotone if and only if alpha is between one half and plus infinity. And I'm not going to give the details here because they all involve some, some higher level matrix analysis techniques, some of them very high level, and I don't give references either because there's a, actually a huge literature of many different ways of proving these things. So. I will maybe add some literature to the slides later and then you can, can follow up. Or you can look into these references that I have given in the beginning. Okay, and now for the rest, we are going to go through this machinery that we established in the beginning to derive information measures from divergences. So now we have these two family of divergences, the PETS type and the sandwich Rényi divergences. And we're going to see what kind of entropies, conditional entropies, mutual information, divergence ready we are getting from these quantities and why they are interesting, if at all. Okay, so the first thing was the entropy. Remember the formula, um, how we defined it. And now we simply replace this delta by the d alpha quantity. And of course we have two families of Rényi divergences. So a priori, we could get two different concepts of Rényi entropy. But it's very easy to see that actually, first of all, we can give an explicit formula for the Rényi entropy. It looks like this. And second, it doesn't matter whether we use the PETS type or the sandwich Rényi divergences because these two operators commute with each other, and in that case, they are the same. Okay? So that, these are the, the Rényi entropies. And again, it's easy to see that in the alpha go to one limit, they give the von Neumann entropy. 
Um, again, it is easy to verify that they are additive. It follows from this formula. They are sure concave. They satisfy this, this nice normalization relation. Zero on pure states, maximal value on maximal limit states, so it knows everything that we might ask from an entropy function. And um, it's also not too difficult to verify, although it needs some, well, a bit of matrix analysis to see that it is concave, if and only if alpha is between 0 and 1. OK. And now we are looking at operational interpretations of this quantity. So the, the question is the, the question that we started with. So Shannon's question was how to quantify the information in a probability distribution. Now our question is how to quantify the information content of a mixed quantum state. And there are two ways to think of a mixed quantum state. If you, if you start to study standard quantum mechanics, where a state is a pure state by definition, um, then the, the way to motivate mixed states is either saying that they are a convex combination of, of pure states, so there is some uncertainty about the state, which is actually a, a pure state. And this is the so-called ensemble picture that we are going to take here. And there is a, an analog of Shannon's source coding or, or source compression theorem in which we imagine that we have a quantum source that emits signals, which are these quantum states. So it, each time instance, it emits a, a quantum state in one of these, these quantum states with a probability pi. So if it runs for n, n time, then the output is going to look like this. Sorry, this psi i stands for also for this projection here for the density operator. And this will appear at the output of the source with this probability. And our goal is to somehow, again, like in Shannon's theorem, store this information efficiently, but instead of classical bits in quantum bits. So we want to have a quantum encoding, a CPTP map, that maps all the outputs into a sequence of qubits with as few qubits as possible, because creating and manipulating and storing qubits is expensive, so we want to use as little as possible. And in the decoding, we go back from these qubits to the original system, and we want to restore these signal sequences or signal states. Okay. And we could choose various fidelity criteria here. It's actually a very interesting problem, which, which one is the good one. We will use a fidelity-based um, criterion for the goodness of this, this scheme. Namely, we look at how large is the fidelity between the original, oh, sorry, it should be, this should be a sequence, right? So this is for n. These all should be sequences, these i's. Um, for one of the signal sequences and between the compressed and decompressed uh, sequence, how large is the fidelity? And we, we average 1 minus the fidelity. OK, so this is going to be our error. This is one picture. And the other picture is the purification picture. So the other, picture, other argument to motivate the use of, of mixed states is to say that they are actually the pure states, but the rest of the pure state is somewhere else in an environment. So we're always the marginal of a, of a pure state on some, some bigger system. And a related problem is to, again, compress the part to which we have access using as few qubits as possible. But now what we want to preserve is the entanglement between the original pure state and the, the decompressed pure state. Okay. So here the, the encoding and decoding is acting only on half of the system. And again, we are evaluating the, the goodness using the fidelity. Okay. So these are two different problems. But it turns out that they are very closely related to each other. Um, and to solve them, we are going to use ideas from the previous part of the talk. So there we were considering state discrimination. And it turns out that it is very useful to, to look at uh, state compression as an application of state discrimination. Namely, we consider the problem um, of state discrimination between the state row and the completely mixed state on the, on the same system. Okay. Then we can run this whole machinery of state discrimination. And we can come up with these Neyman-Pearson projections. 
And why, it, why this is good to consider uh, this thing is because apart from normalization, the type two error probability here is nothing but the dimension of the system which we use for the storage of our state. Okay, so this gives somehow the intuition why it is a good idea to, to look at this state discrimination problem. So the type one error is going to be the error which we are interested in, and the type two error is going to be the dimension of the storage system. Okay. And what we do is we just take this name on Pearson projections from state discrimination with some parameter C, and the compression is what has been established by, by Schumacher in, in his original paper. We just sandwich the state um, with these two projections, and we put the remainder into some random fixed state. Okay? And here the, um, well, the range of this, this compression projection is, is more or less isomorphic to, to k and qubits, the, the space of k and qubits. And for the decoding, we just take a trivial one. So we, we embed this, these qubits back to or, or we, we put back this operator into the original system. Okay. And this is an easy exercise to show that in this case, if you are looking at the ensemble picture and the error criterion there, that's upper bounded by the purification error criterion, and that in turn is upper bounded by this expression, which is nothing else but the type one error probability corresponding to this projection. Okay. So this is how state compression connects to state discrimination and then we can use the results from the previous part, and it turns out that for every coding rate here, we get this kind of exponential upper bounds. Okay. And this is a theorem by Hayashi from 2002, is that this is actually sharp. And in this case, the exact error exponent can be written in this formula, which is just a direct analog of what we have seen before for state discrimination, unsurprisingly. And instead of the Rainy divergences, we have the Rainy entropies appearing here for all alpha between zero and one. So we get an operational interpretation for the Rainy entropies. Very good. Okay. And for the converse, remember that in state discrimination, we had, we had a direct part and the converse part, and we have established exponents for both. Uh, the situation is not, so good, not as good um, in, in the state compression case. What we can establish is that, uh, sorry, this should be smaller. If we try to compress the, the source more than the entropy, than the von Neumann entropy, um, then this error is going to go to one exponentially fast. So this is going to be, uh, so this, this means that this problem has a strong converse property, and the von Neumann entropy is a sharp threshold for the change of the behavior for rates below and above. And this is just Schumacher compression theorem, with, and, and this gives a, an operational interpretation of the von Neumann entropy. Okay? And curiously, even though the problem in some level seems simpler than state discrimination, because you are comparing a, a quantum state to the identity, um, it, turn, it turns out that the, the strong converse exponent is not known in this case. So here's an open problem for you to, to work on if you're interested in it. Okay. This was one operational interpretation of Rainy entropies. and other one is given by entanglement concentration. I will only very briefly and not, not in very much detail explain it uh, for a few reasons that, that I will highlight during it. So the goal here is that we have some pure state which is entangled, but not maximally entangled. These are the Schmidt coefficients. And our aim is to get maximally entangled EPR pair pairs from many copies of the state. So we have n copies of this state, and we want to get as many copies of EPR pairs out of it as we can by only using LOCC operations. Okay. So this is a classic problem in quantum information theory. And error exponents were established for this problem. The setup is a little bit different from, from the previously considered ones. Uh, you can consider it in a probabilistic scenario when, the, when you can explicitly 
create this state with certain probability and with some other probability the, the protocol fails. And we can, we can fix um, the asymptotics of this success probability. So we can require that the success probability goes to one with, with a fixed exponent. And then it turns out that the optimal extraction rate of EPR pairs is given by such a formula. So again, we get a, an operational interpretation of the Rainy entropies. So this is the Rainy entropy of the first marginal of the state. Okay. <coughs> and likewise, we can get the strong converse exponent with a similar uh, formula. And what is interesting about this result, well, first of all, that it is an important problem and it's good to know these exponents. But from our point of view is that um, before we have seen that for direct problems, you get rainy quantities with alpha between zero and one. And for strong converse problems, with alpha between, for alpha larger than one. And here this is swapped. Okay, so this is somehow anomalous, this problem. And also these expressions are not exactly the same form as what we have seen before for state discrimination. Yeah? So, did you have any hints for experimentalists trying to build something that does this? Uh, no, sorry. I'm a mathematician, so I'm as far removed from experimentalist as possible. Um, but maybe someone in the audience <laughs> can help with that. <laughs> well, anyone has a recommendation for experimental implementations? Okay, maybe in the coffee break, people are more creative. <laughs> okay, and another reason why I wanted to, to explain is, is that there is a very nice recent result where they generalize this problem where you want to extract not necessarily maximally entangled states, EPR pairs, but an other arbitrary entangled pure state. So you want to convert one entangled pure state to another one with an optimal rate. Okay. And it turns out that in this case you can also determine the strong converse exponent, and you get this formula where the Rainy entropies of both of these states appear. And what is very nice about this result is that it uses techniques which are totally different from standard techniques in information theory. So it uses um, something from complexity theory, ordered semi-rings, and, um, and mysteriously they get these exponents out of this. So there's a poster about this in the conference. I can recommend you to, to go and have a look. I think it's a very interesting result because it, as I said, it introduces some totally new technique into quantum information theory. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh my God! So, so much for the advertisement. Then look at the paper. I mean, based on the the author's name and and the the title, you can find it on the archive. Okay, it's worth having a look. Well, thanks for the <laughs> for the comment. Okay. So, so much about Rainy entropies. Now let's move on to conditional Rainy entropies, which are much more involved than than entropies. So remember that this was our definition. We have a bipartite state, and we are looking at how far it is from a decoupled system where the first system is completely mixed state. Okay? And it turns out that we have a very simple identity, the quantum Simpson identity. So for any particular rho and sigma, you can write this Rainy divergence in this form. So now we are using the PES type Rainy divergences. And because the Rainy divergences are strictly positive, and this is a non-negative quantity, this means that you will find this infimum if and only if you choose this state to be this particular state which is written here. So you can explicitly write up the minimizer here, which is a very, well, something not really expected. And with the help of that, you can write up an explicit formula for the conditional Rainy divergence, which is just given by this. So this is very nice. And this is manifestly additive. So if you put here a tensor product, then this is going to be a, a sum because of the logarithm here and because multiplicativity of the trace. Okay. So this is very useful. Unfortunately or not, um, we don't have a, such an explicit expression for the sandwiched conditional Rainy divergences. 
So if we want to establish additivity, which we want from any information measure, then we have to follow some different way. Who remembers what way we followed to establish additivity? Oops. That's fantastic. <laughs> ah, that's because you switched on the Wi-Fi, right? Oh, shoot. OK, OK, OK. Oops. Sorry for the internet zoom. <laughs> At least you wake up. Um, OK. So, so who remembers what we used for conditional entropies to establish additivity? Yeah, Mark remembers, but uh, <laughs> of course he does. Anyone else from the audience? So there was this curious, very nice property of the conditional entropies that we, we couldn't derive from the properties of the divergence. And it had a lot of implications, like uncertainty relations, and monogamy of correlations, and additivity. Duality, indeed. Thank you very much. You restored my faith <laughs> in the efficiency of my lecture, <laughs> at least to some extent. OK, so indeed, uh, it would be very nice to have duality relations, because then even without such an explicit formula, we could prove additivity. And as it turns out, there are indeed duality relations. So I'm only referring to Marco Otomo Mihal's textbook, but there are a number of papers that dealt with this problem. And actually, there are. Uh, more than one duality relations. So it turns out that the sandwich range divergences are dual to each other, or the conditional versions, for different parameters, if alpha and beta are related by this formula. Okay? But then, this is not the end of the story. There are other duality relations. So remember, we considered conditional entropies also when we don't use the optimization, but we use the margin of the original state. This was this down arrow thing. And these guys are also dual to each other for a differently related alpha and beta parameter set. Okay. And then there is yet another uh, duality relation, namely the, now here we consider the optimized sandwiched, here we consider the non-optimized PETS divergence, and now we can connect the optimized pads and the non-optimized sandwich with yet another uh, duality relation, with yet another relation between alpha and beta. So we immediately have three different families of duality relations, which means we can have three different families of mon monogamy of correlation relations and uh, uncertainty relations and whatever. And also we can establish the, the additivity of the sandwiched Rainy conditional entropy for its whole parameter range where, where the original divergence is monotone. Okay? And this also gives us an alternative proof for the additivity of the, of the conditional PETS type divergence. Okay? And moreover, um, it is easy to see that using the same techniques, you can actually also establish the additivity of the Rainy mutual informations. Okay? And to find an operational interpretation, we go to state discrimination. So we consider the problem where we have a bipartite state, many copies of it, and we want to decide if, if the system is in this bipartite state, or if the system, two parts of the system are independent, the first one is in a completely mixed state or maximally mixed state, and the second one is arbitrary. Okay. It is clear that this is very well suited for the definition of the, of the conditional any divergence. And indeed, we find that in this case, we can express the, the direct and the strong converse exponent. And you get the exact analogs of, of the formulas that we have seen before, except that instead of the divergences, now you have the conditional entropies. OK, very nice. And the same works for the Rainy mutual information. So if you replace the maximally mixed state with the first marginal of the state, Again, you can run, the, run this machinery for, for the state discrimination problem. And again, you can express the, the, diver, the direct and, and com strong converse exponents using the Rainy mutual informations. This for the, the PETS type, this for the sandwich type. Okay. So we get operational interpretations for all of these, um, these information quantities. OK, so much about this. And now for the very last part, I move over to this divergence radii, 
which loot maybe the least motivated concepts uh, in the first abstract part. So now I will try to convince you that they are actually important. Okay. So remember, we can consider divergence radio for an, for an arbitrary set of, of states. Here we will consider a finite set of states. And we will, consider, we will think of this finite set of states as the output of a, a classical quantum channel. Um, so a classical quantum channel has some input signals. They can, they can form an arbitrary set. And the channel outputs a quantum state on, on each of these input signals. Actually, we, we don't need to require that this is finite. So this can be the state space of some quantum, quantum system or whatever. And remember, this was our definition of the weighted Rayleigh divergence ready. Well, we defined it for an, for an arbitrary divergence. This hash mark here is for, it means that it can be either the PETS type or the sandwich type. So this was the definition. And, uh, and in two very recent papers um, by Cheng and Min Su Xie and uh, Tomohiro Ogawa and myself, we have shown that you cannot find an explicit expression for this minimizer here or the value of this. But it turns out that a state is a minimizer if and only if it's a fixed point of a very nonlinear map. Okay. This for the PETS type and this for the, the sandwich Rainy divergence. And it's not actually important what the exact form of this map is. What is important is if you start taking tensor powers of this channel and tensor powers of this distribution, then this map is going to map every tensor power input into the tensor power of the outputs. So this will show that if I'm taking tensor powers here and look for the minimizer, then the minimizer will be the tensor power of the minimizer for the single copies, which immediately shows that this quantity is going to be additive. Okay. So this formula is ugly. You cannot, solve an, you cannot find an explicit solution, but you can derive additivity from it. Yeah? Should the signals be sigma bars? You said it's a fixed point. Of the yeah, 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 thanks. Yeah, so this should be sigma bar, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Sigma bar was forgotten. OK, so as I said, we have additivity, which means that we take the tensor power channel, and, um, and we take tensor power probability distributions. Okay. Is this clear what the statement is? More or less? OK, anyway, so we have seen this expression before. And in this particular case, we can establish additivity. OK. And the question is whether these quantities are important at all. And it turns out that, yes, they are. So we can consider classical quantum channel coding. I don't know how many of you is familiar with classical quantum channel coding and Holevo Schumacher Westmoreland theorem. OK, not too many. <laughs> uh, so the, the situation is that we have this classical quantum channel. We want to use it to communicate classical messages. And for this purpose, we can use the channel many times, n times. And our encoding is just choosing input sequences of the channel for each possible message. And on the output, make a POVM, so make a, a state discrimination to determine which message has been sent. Okay. And constant composition means that we are only allowed to use code words where the relative frequency, frequency of each symbol from this set is the same independent of the, of the message that we are sending. Okay. This is a, a standard problem in, in information theory. And moreover, we fix a probability distribution, and these empirical distributions have to converge to this fixed probability distribution. Okay. So this is the setup. And it turns out that we can consider the, the communication rate, which is just the log of the number of messages divided by the number of channel uses. And if this is larger than the, the weighted relative entropy radius of the, of the image of the channel, which is nothing else but the whole evil quantity, then the average success probability decays exponentially fast. And we can express the exponent in an explicit form. We get something which looks exactly the same as for state discrimination. But here we get this sandwiched Rainy divergence radius. Okay. So in this particular communication problem, 
we get an operational interpretation of this sandwich range divergence ready. Okay. So they are indeed important. Yeah, this gives an operational interpretation. Okay. And this additivity that I have explained before plays an important part on, in the proof. Okay. And uh, also without constant composition, so without imposing this constraint, we can also establish the, the strong converse exponent where we get the non-weighted divergence radius here. So that was the other quantity that we, that we introduced. So again, we get an operational interpretation. And here's a reminder that at the end of this, this block about information quantities, we have established that taking the supremum over the weighted divergence ready over all possible probability distributions gives us the non-weighted divergence ready. So connecting to this, somehow, you get the strong converse exponent, and then you take the supremum over all p, and then you get uh, the non-constant non composition strong converse exponent. But of course, this is not completely true, because in this coding problem, you can use any kind of uh, coding, whereas in the, in the constant composition, you are restricted to, con to constant compositions. OK. OK. So, uh, Another question is, what about the, the direct exponent for classical quantum channel coding and the Rényi divergence ready for alpha smaller than 1? And this is a notoriously difficult question. This is called the error exponent for channel coding. And this is unsolved, even in the classical case. Okay. And there are not even, um, well, OK, there are a lot of open questions around this problem. But what is true? is that if you are coding with a rate below the capacity, then the error probability goes to 0, at least exponentially fast. I'm denoting the exponent like this. And there is something called the, the sphere packing bound. Sorry, there's a p missing here, uh, in, which is very famous in classical information theory. And very recently, uh, Marco Dalai and Andreas Winter established a, a classical quantum version of this. And they have shown that this exponent is upper bounded by this expression, which again looks exactly the same as what we have seen before. But now we have the PETS type Rényi divergences and the corresponding divergence radius. Okay. But this is only an upper bound. And you know that channels may have zero error capacity. So it may be possible to, to communicate over a, over a classical quantum channel with zero error. And then, of course, your your error probability is 0, so your exponent is plus infinity. Okay. So in this case, this upper bound has to be plus infinity. And the, this behaves in a way that it is finite for a, an open interval on the right. And there is a smallest value at which this becomes infinity. And that smallest value is nothing else but the another divergence radius of the range of the channel corresponding to the zero Rényi divergence. Okay. So this, again, has some, some important operational interpretation. And the most beautiful thing about this result, I think, is that, I, sorry, I'm going very quick here, but you either know these things or it would take extremely long to, to explain the details. But what turns out is that if you take all classical quantum channels with the same confusability graph, and optimize this divergence radius over all such channels with the same confusability graph, then you get something which is called Martin's weighted version of, of the Lovas theta function. So Lovas theta function is, is very important in zero error communication. And somehow it turns out, and it's, it's, an, it's an upper bound over, over the zero error communication rate. And it turns out that somehow you can obtain this by considering classical quantum channels. Um, and this is something very unexpected, because this is a completely classical object. And taking the maximum overall all probability distribution B, you, P, you get the, the Lovas theta function. So I, I think this is, a, this is a really, really beautiful result. OK, and I still have five minutes. And that's going to be enough to, to finish my talk. So a few more things that you can do with, with Rényi divergences, instead of comparing the how far states are from away, how far away states are from each other, you can compare how far away channels are from each other. 
And you can define the, the channel divergence for any particular divergence on, on states. The channel divergence is defined as an optimization of taking inputs to the channels, allowing uh, a quantum environment R, letting the channel act on half of the state, and optimizing over all possible input states. And this concept is a generalization of, of a concept of states. Namely, if you take so-called replacer channels that just trace out everything and map everything to the same fixed state, then this channel divergence reduces to the, to the divergence of, this, of the states for ev every, every divergence that is stable. Okay? And I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can consider discrimination problem for channels. So you have an unknown channel and you want to decide the identity of this channel. And then, of course, what you can do is you feed states into these channels, look at the outputs, and try to decide based on the output which channel is acting on your state. So it becomes a state discrimination problem. And if you are only allowed to use product strategies, then it becomes a state discrimination problem as we have seen before. Okay. But in general, you can use uh, entanglement between the inputs. You can use adaptive strategies. You can use much more complex strategies than just feeding in independent inputs. And it turns out that in some particular situations, you can still determine the strong converse exponent, for instance. Namely, if the, if the second channel is a replacer channel, or both channels are, are classical quantum, then you get the same expression for the strong converse exponent, where here, instead of the, the divergence of the states, you have the divergence of the channels. So this is completely analogous to, to state discrimination. OK. Uh, and now it's an interesting question that once you can establish divergences for channels, then you could run the same machinery as what we have established for states in the beginning and try to define entropies, conditional entropies, mutual informations, and whatever. And now I'm sure that this poster is going to be presented because at least one of the authors is here. Uh, so this, this is about, uh, about this problem. Okay, so I can again recommend you to, to go and check out this poster. Okay, and a few further topics that I haven't covered in my talk but are very interesting and, and related to entropies. So recently, well, of course, entropy has been related to thermodynamics earlier than, than to information theory. But recently, there's a, a big interest in, um, in quantum thermodynamics and, and using all sorts of entropies to derive um, refined results in, in thermodynamics. So Rainy, and there are many results using Rainy entropies to characterize uh, possible straight state transitions, like thermal operations. This is related to various generalizations of majorizations, and so on. It, it's beautiful, and it's a very huge topic, so, so I, I haven't touched on this. But again, I can recommend you to, to go and see this poster, which is only using von Neumann entropy and not Rainy, Rainy entropies, but it is very closely related to this problem. So characterizing possible state tra transitions using entropies. And another big topic which I haven't touched on is, uh, is smooth entropies, which is a different way of, of approaching information theory problems. And it has lots of applications in information theory, cryptography, and also in thermodynamics. Uh, but this is so big in itself that it would take a whole tutorial to, to say something about it. So maybe that could be a tutorial for a future QIP. And again, I can recommend you a, a, a poster which uses smooth entropies in, in quantum thermodynamics. And that's it. I'm, I'm, there are some references. I'm going to update it. And, and the slides are going to be online. So if you're interested, you can go through it come back to, to things that you didn't understand. I'm going to be around, so you can ask me questions if you want. Uh, solve the exercises that would help you a lot to, to understand them or, or to get a feeling about the topic. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And yeah. <laughs>